As customary in Australia, we will begin with an acknowledgement of country. This is to acknowledge our and recognise our First Nation people. Sorry. My... For some of us tonight, we are gathered on Noongar country. So before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of, the, of this land where I am and a few others, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. I acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent whose cultures are among the oldest living cultures in human history. Let us pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging. May we listen and hear and always be respectful of what they have brought to this country. Over to you, Pat. Thank you, Gemma. The prayer I've chosen for tonight comes from a book of prayers that was prepared for uh, the Australian YCS uh, groups around Australia. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, please fill us with your spirit of love. Help us to see the world as you do, to judge with your heart and to act with the strength and courage you have shown us as we work to transform our world. Amen. Thanks very much, Thank Pat. Now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Father Mike D. Dominican from South Africa. I've known Father Mike for more than 30 years now. Just before we started, I was trying to, we were trying to recollect uh, when we first met, and I believe it was about 1992 when we were both obviously a lot younger, and I was visiting South Africa on behalf of the International YCW, and Father Mike was part of the community of Dominicans at Mayfair in the suburbs of Johannesburg, a great community it was too, with some very committed uh, Dominican priests, including Father Albert Nolan, who may be well known to uh, others of you here a community of Dominicans that was very involved in the local community, as was Mike himself, and even in the anti-apartheid struggle of, the, of, the, of that time that was just coming to a conclusion. So I, I, I think I'll leave the, the technical parts for Mike to introduce himself, but I will say that uh, he did start with the YCS himself, I believe as a student, as a university student, starting the YCS among university students in South Africa and moved later, just after that, around that 1992 period, to become national chaplain of the movement there, and later international chaplain. And based on, I guess, all that different experience that he accumulated, he later worked for the Dominicans as their justice and peace coordinator, based in Rome and Geneva. And now he's back there as prior for his community in Peter Maritzburg. So Mike, it's really a great pleasure to have you here, and to hear you, and, uh, we look forward to listening to you now. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you, Stefan, and greetings to all of you. It's a delight for me to to be here, and thank you for organising this. And I think we need to thank Hilary Regan for agreeing to republish this book, which I wrote in 2006, 2007. Um, when uh, I was the international chaplain of YCS. Um, and there I was working with Manoch, who was on the team, who's here with us, and Minuko, who was helping us. She was the regional coordinator for Asia. And she was she helped to, to, to produce this book with Manoch initially. So we have good history in this room. So I, and thanks to Hillary for agreeing to republish this. So uh, obviously some people may have ra raised the question, you know, after uh, 17 years, surely a book like this is out of date <laughs> and to republish it again. But anyway, it's been, uh, it was produced as something that hopefully would be rather timeless. And maybe the fact that it's been republished is a is a good sign of the fact that uh, not only this book, but what uh, Joseph Cardane's message and uh, innovations were 
remain quite timeless as well for all of us and for the world and for the church. So it's an, it may be an acknowledgement of all of that. Um, I Just to tell you how this book came about, um, way back when we were in Paris on the international team, um, I we know one of the reflections of the team on a regular basis was the fact that everyone in YCS, when you ask them what is YCS about, they would always say it's about See, Judge, Act. So See, Judge, Act became the slogan and the point of identity for uh, all YCS members. That was what made them distinctive or distinguished them from others. And I'm sure uh, uh, many of the members of the other movements, especially YCW, but all the other Catholic action, specialized Catholic action movements would have said a similar thing. See, Judge Act was the, the war cry, if you like, or the, the way of understanding our identity. But what we began to realize as we, especially as time moved on and when we moved into the the, the 2000s, uh, the years 2000, and we began to see the conditions had changed quite dramatically. Um, and the, the schooling and universities became a different sort of place and different kettle of fish with different priorities. And students often didn't have enough time to even be involved in things. And uh, the, there were many uh, demands placed on students more and more by the, the, the curricula as, as governments took more and more control of, of determining curricula in schools and universities. That left less and less time for students to actually do the things that we expected them to do in the in YCS. And this led to a situation where we found that many groups and many movements around the world were using what they said was see, judge, and act. But in fact, when you looked deeply at what they were actually doing, um, they, were, they were far from the actual uh, using the method in the way in which it was intended to be used. And that led to a situation often where there was very little deep analysis, where there was very little theological reflection, um, where there was very little action even. And so the, the international team at the time, of which Manoch was the general secretary, um, they felt that we really needed to give a lot more formation in what is the review of life, what is the Sea Judge Act all about? And that's why they asked me to, to write this booklet. So it took, uh, it took a couple of years to get to the point of finalizing it. Um, but the whole, but eventually it came out just before we um, ended our mandate in 2007. So at least it, there's a bit of a legacy that we were able to leave there. And the hope was that through this book, we would, we would be encouraging training sessions of YCS all over the world um, and anyone beyond who would find it useful. So that's why the book contains, besides focusing on the spirituality of, of YCS and of the Catholic Action Movements, the spirit and the methodology of see, judge, and act. Um, it has at the end. It has some training pro, some suggestions for how to run a training program on how to use the method in local situations. And I was the interesting thing is that I've just come back for this webinar. From I had to take a break in a week long course I'm teaching to evangelical seminarians here in Peter Marisburg, where I am, uh, Pentecostal evangelicals. Most many of them are pastors in their own little churches around the place. And they asked me to run a course on siege and on um, justice and peace. So a central part of what I've been doing there has been 
to train him in how to, in the methodology and the spirituality of of what this book is all about. And in fact, to to lead, lead him on their own while I ran away to do this webinar, I gave them, in fact, the 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 list of questions in the back of the book on how to run a C Judge Act meeting. So it's an existential moment, <laughs> even for me and for those around me, using this while I'm talking to you about it and using that book already. So it's it's it, it brought home to me, and especially after Hillary proposed to republish the book, it brought home to me how it, the value that it could still have. You know, if I if it hadn't happened, I don't know if it would have come to my mind to use that precisely for this course that I'm running at the moment. So it's been a good uh, spark for me too. Just coming to the what the book actually consists of the <clears throat> i suppose the first thing that might raise some questions is the fact that we're talking about it as a spirituality whereas most of the time when people think of see judge and act they think of it in terms of a methodology but the way in which we, we we conceived of this book in fact is to see this methodology not just as a uh, the see the methodology of see judge act is not simply uh, a mechanical using of a particular methodology but it is the practical working out of a deeper spirituality which needs to be identified and in that sense we have used as Cardane himself used the basis being in the his theology, if you like, of the three truths, the theology or his spirituality of the three truths that we face, the truth of life, the truth of faith, and the truth of method or movement. <clears throat> and we, I've, we found it important to focus on this as a spirituality because so often we found ourselves in especially in global church circles, people would lump us into a basket of being the the action movements or the activist movements, <clears throat> and they compared us to what they called the spiritual movements. And we that was a very hard pill to swallow and made us realize that we were emphasizing see, judge, act, in emphasizing action, reflection, and there was no mention in that sense of spirituality, and that made people think that we didn't have a spirituality, <clears throat> that we were just activists like so many other political activists around the place. So that's when we realized that we had to be able to locate what we were doing in the context of a spirituality, because it is a spirituality, even if we haven't explicitly used that um, we haven't explicitly used that terminology. So we felt that this book, in fact, needs to talk primarily about what we are doing as the deepening of a spirituality. And that's what it is. We, we come with a particular spirit, a way of understanding God, a way of understanding Jesus, and how that manifests itself in our lives and in our action and in our movements. So that focus was was vital and that's why we have called this we've given this book the name discovering god through action and reflection because the original thing was talking about a spirituality of integral uh, an integral spirituality or an integral methodology or something like that um so what we try to do in this book is to Frame it all in terms of the spirituality of the three truths, if you like, um, and, uh, and show how it works itself out practically and concretely. The particular elements of each, which we've tried to hone in on, of course, the truth of life and the sea part is a thing that people normally do pretty well. Um, I think uh, everyone knows that 
we started with a concrete situation, although not everyone does. Some people started with general situations, but started with a concrete story. And, um, and we're normally quite good at doing analysis about that, to asking the question, why? Why, why, why until you die was the slogan where you would have. Um, and um, people are normally good at that. So I, I do focus on that. And we do focus just on the looking at all the dimensions of life. So we have in there the, whole, the onion of our different relationships, you know, starting with my relationship with myself, my close uh, family and friends and What's not in the book, which I developed only later, it's a pity we should have that we would have produced a, a more recent onion there for the book. It includes things like our close relationship to water and the air and the land and the fruit of the earth, which are which bring in all the environmental and other issues which maybe we didn't consider as much when we first produced the book. But um but anyway, the the, the issue of Looking deeply, the C part is normally quite well done. <clears throat> the issue of the judge part has always been a difficulty in our in our movement and maybe movements. You know, some people just have traditionally when you get to the judge part, they think about what text does does Jesus mention this? And we talk about we just look for texts that match what we think Jesus should have said. <clears throat> and and then we move on to the act. In fact, often the judge part has been seen as something which we can we can do if we have time. And uh, often, and we know often in our meetings we don't have that much time. We always in a rush. So often we skip over the judge and move quickly to the action, which is maybe a little bit easier to understand because we know that we just got to do something concrete. <clears throat> even though often we end up our meetings without much action. But so I focused a lot on this question of judge to try and make sense of what is this judge moment in using this methodology. Um, and so, and of course, here we're talking about the need to take a step back to really try and get into the, um, into what is what are the looking at what the actions with the eyes of Christ or the ears of Christ or the heart of Christ of Jesus and the need to see what we're doing as part of a, a permanent search for the truth. So a major part of this judge part is self-reflection, questioning our own, my own attitudes, my own, especially my own unconscious assumptions, because we all come to every meeting with assumptions and we don't easily question what those assumptions are. So the major part of this of this section is helping us to really um, to look self-critically at this moment. Where do I come from? What are my assumptions, my cultural assumptions? What are my even my political and maybe even religious assumptions that I'm Sorry, sorry. Um, and I, um, so we, we to to focus on those assumptions, I think is a crucial element because that's where the area of conversion comes in. So the judge moment is meant to be a moment of conversion for for all of us when we use this methodology, and um, I, and that's where uh, that's where we put a lot of emphasis. So hopefully this book can help to deepen that understanding about what sort of conversion or how to facilitate conversion in, by you, in the use of this methodology for me and what I believe. And um, that's, that I think was, is probably one of the, the, the innovative things about this book, if I can put it in those terms. Because the rest we're all used to doing active seeing and and acting and developing and understanding about what sort of action we need and of course the whole thing about developing a spirituality of action is crucial where we see and that's in the last part where we see the need to 
be seen what we are doing, no matter how small, as something that can have an impact. And because we all, and certainly here in South Africa, often people used to think that if I, if we weren't organizing a big rally or meeting or a march or something like that, uh, we weren't really doing action. And so the important thing here was to focus on the fact that no, just like the parable of the mustard seed, there's no action that can be too small, as long as it's a small step in the direction of trying to um, address the issue that we're talking about. Even if it's just talking to someone about the issue, it's a small action, and to help everyone to realize the smallness of an action. And the last point that I make in, in that, in that, in that act, section on action which maybe we don't always talk about is how we need to we need to be conscious of what we're doing. In fact, as an action, um, and I give the example of my trip to Lebanon one of those years. I think it was in about two thousand and six, where I went to meet a group in uh, Saida, and uh, I. I was asking, and on the way there, I saw a whole lot of signs all along the road um, with all written in Arabic, which I didn't understand, but there was a YCA symbol there, which I could understand. And when I arrived in the meeting, I was asking them, tell me about what actions you're doing. And they would all, they spoke about all the meetings they had, the conferences they had, the, the, the celebrations they had, the, et, et cetera. And I said to them, but no one has mentioned what I saw on the way here. What are all these signs on the road coming there? They said, oh, yes, we, you know, we decided to get involved in an action to, to clean up the city. And we wanted to make ourselves visible so people knew it's not just Muslims who do that because we are a Christian minority there. We wanted to do that. But they didn't think to report that to me which meant that that was a, almost like taken for granted and a, and a bit of an aside. So we have to be conscious that action in YSS is not necessarily um, the activities we do. It's, it's an action that comes out of a concrete reflection, like that action that I spoke, that I just it described. All the activities we have to bring people together, to have meetings, even to have talks and that sort of thing, those are not necessarily actions in, in, our, in our sense as YCS or YCW, whatever. Um, they, those, they could be an action if we saw that in order to address something, we need to have such an event. But normally an activity is something organized by the leaders for the, the members. And that doesn't necessarily fall into the, the same category as an action as we understand it. But anyway, that's just a, a little thing that I hone in, hone on in the, hone in on in the book. And um, we, uh, and, and hopefully it's, it's helped to deepen a bit of understanding, of course, uh, of, about YCS, about the methodology, about the spirituality we have. Of course, I, I give a, a reading list of others who've written on this topic. I'm not, I wasn't the first, and there are many others who have probably done more profound things that are also written in the book, starting with people like Pellegree and um, many others around, besides Gardain himself, of course, and all the YCW um, they have produced many documents and things on the spirituality and on this booklet, many parts of the world throughout. So this is just a little contribution in addition to that whole movement that has been there for uh, over a hundred years now. And um, and I think that with that, um, maybe I'll draw to a close and say how delighted I am. And again, a big thank you to Hilary for, for producing the book. And a big thank you to Stefan for initiating this uh, webinar and to the opportunity to meet up with many old and new friends and uh, hopefully this can contribute towards deepening the spirituality 
especially amongst young people, but amongst all people at the end of the day, even like I'm doing with this relatively middle-aged um, group of evangelical pastors that I'm busy teaching at the moment. So thank you for this opportunity and it's open over to you and let's have a discussion. So Mike, thank you very much. And we will have a few questions and comments before we let you get back to your evangelical pastors. Um, you, you acknowledge Hillary's efforts in getting the book available and published for us again. So I'm going to ask Hillary, first of all, if you could tell us how we can get hold of the book. So if you don't mind. Um, this book is published within our Cardine Studies journal. It's number five, volume one, for 2024. Um, the journal is, uh, the aim is to document the history of the Joseph Cardine inspired lay movements, both historically and in the present day, as well as examining the rich tradition of the Catholic social teaching on the church in the world of today. Articles cover a range of areas, the spirituality, methodology and history of these traditions and the movements in the church and into society. And so when I was aware of this uh, book that had been produced a number of years ago, as Mike says, um, I suggested it should go into the journal. And we do the journal both as a journal and as a book. And so it is distributed locally, but also internationally in the UK and the US, goes into Amazon and to all those other avenues. In the next week, it will also be in EPUB uh, off our website. So ATF Press, I'll put it into the chat, the website um, where you can purchase it. I think Guy Hans has already purchased a copy and I hope that has arrived for him. He um, purchased it off the website. Um, and so the book was also produced in French and in Spanish. And so next year we will do the book also in those other two, two languages. But the website is very simple, atfpress.com. As of next week, it'll be in EPUB and uh, you will be able to internationally buy it much more easily in, in EPUB. Uh, the next edition of it, um, I'll let Mike talk about because it's it's a, another focus on South Africa and also on the YCS. And then, um, but um, maybe Mike could could speak about that, and I'll explain about the. He, he did refer to the Ben Ben Pellegrin, and one of the future editions is we are going to be republishing this book of Ben of uh, Pellegrin's IMCSI YCS their option and their pedagogy from 1979. We will reprint that probably next year, but uh, I'll let Mike explain the the next uh, edition at some stage either now or or a little later. Uh, Mike, do you want to do that right now before we get on to the next little bit? Um, I'm not sure I understood what you want me to explain, Hilary, when you say the next The next edition, edition which will be on Carly. Oh, okay. Um, well, when we, when we founded YCS in universities in South Africa, um, it's a came at the time when I was the president of NCFS. And here we have Kevin Wright amongst us, who was the vice president at the time when I was the president. <clears throat> and, and together with Kali Hanukom, who was my predecessor as president, and he became the, the full-time worker for Catholic students when he finished being president. And the national chaplain was Albert Nolan. It was at a particular time in the history of this country where we were grappling with how to um, reconcile because the black students had all left, um, had walked out of the Catholic student movement because they, they were a minority and they felt that they were not, uh, it was part of the black consciousness movement of Steve Biko. And they felt that in the South African context, we came together in conferences, we had nice discussions and we went home and nothing changed. So they felt they had to establish themselves separately. That was a, a very big blow for the white students there. And they, when they, they were, so when I entered, the black students all just left, and that's when they were struggling with this issue about what to do. And um, when Kali was president, he initiated a lot of things um, 
together with Albert, who was the national chaplain, to try and get us together. And we went to visit the black students on their campuses and to discuss what was necessary for reconciliation. And we all came together in a big meeting. It was just before I became president. Kali was still the president, where it was like all the campuses, black and white, were together. And we were focused on the idea of Christian liberation. And we had to focus on what was oppression. And, and as I was listening to all these stories of all of the black students, I realized that even though I was in South Africa, I was appalled. I had never heard these stories because apartheid was so successful in keeping us apart. But the point I'm making is that Kali was the main instigator of bringing that process. That was a major conversion experience for me. And, uh, and it, uh, it resulted in the same thing for many other students. So after that, when I became president with Kali and with Albert, and Albert had gone to the IMCS World Session in Lima in Peru in 1975, and that's we'd also met Gustavo Gutierrez and others, and they had uh, he discovered Sea Judge Act. And at the same time he was doing that, we had that we were trying to rethink NCFS to make us more effective and respond to the situation. And Kali had gone to YCW to to learn the method because we realized that they had, they had a methodology we could learn from. So with Albert and Kali's experiences and with me being the president, we decided to start Sea Judge Act groups on all university campuses. And then about uh, a year later, we formalized that into a YCS in universities because YCW had asked us if we could take over some of the the, gr the groups in schools that they regarded as middle class that didn't quite fit what they understand or they, they were in the process of change to be much more worker orientated. So with Kali, we, we started the YCS in universities and Kali was in some ways the, the brains behind it. Now Kali, uh, he was also instrumental in setting up the Southern African um, uh, the Southern African and the African coordination of, of YCS. So he was around um, working with Andre Kule, where they they set up the first Pan-African Council meeting, which I also attended, which was held in Belgium, interestingly, in Dwarf. And um, that's where the first Pan-African um, coordination was set up. Kali was very instrumental in that process, and uh, as well as the Southern African coordination. So after that, he he sort of didn't he he, he did, had no more real involvement with YCS directly because he was in in Zimbabwe he was uh, he was away from us and he, but he came back a lot later but when he came back he was in another space in a way and um, unfortunately last year he he died um, and um, I was very grateful that I could see him a few times just in the weeks before in, in the, the weeks before he was hospitalized and then died where I could interview him about um, all his many of the experiences because we were busy producing the book on Albert Nolan reluctant prophet that Hillary's published as well and um, I was the main editor of that and um, so I wanted to get I thought we couldn't write a book about Albert without talking about Kali, because Kali, in some ways, had a dramatic impact on Albert and was part of his own conscientization in a way. It was a mutual thing for the two of them. And so I felt we couldn't do without that. So I ended up, I interviewed him about it and we were able to talk about it in one of the articles in the book. So with him having died, there was a huge outpouring, not quite to the same extent as when Albert died, but um, we, and that I think at his memorial, many important things were said, and that's what led to Hillary being keen to publish what, what, what something about Kali's life. So he was a dear friend and mentor for me personally, and um, and for many others as well. So that gives the background to that book that um, that uh, Hillary's about to publish on Kali Hanako. And Thanks Mike, that. Mike has Sorry, contributed yeah. to that and a number of other people who were involved in NCFS and other 
of the student movements in South Africa, giving a very good background and history of the movement in South Africa. Thanks for that, Hilary. And I not notice you've put the details for the mm. access in the book in the chat. Mm. Um, I'm going to um, throw to Innocent Odongo now. Innocent's from the IYCS. So we're very grateful, very pleased to have Innocent on the call today. So uh, if you'd like to say a few words, Innocent, about your work and where we're up to at the moment, that would be very welcome. Yeah, thank you, uh, Paul, for giving me the opportunity. I will I will not take so much time. Initially, I had planned to share this time with the incoming Secretary General, but unfortunately it happens that the call is happening at the time. He's traveling back from the city to his hometown where he had gone to do his visa interviews. So I will just use the opportunity as we gather for this uh, very enlightening session uh, to just share my heartfelt um joy and gratitude uh, for the rich insight uh, that uh, we have just received from Father Mike. And um, I want to say that uh, the profound reflection um, on the spirituality of the young Christian students, the YCS uh, that Father Mike shared with us uh, through his book has deeply touched and inspired uh, many, many, many of us and uh, other leaders of the YCS all around the world, but even uh, other young people that have had the opportunity to uh, get a hand on this book or maybe to get a chance uh, to read it. Um, the spirituality of uh, YCS offers us a very powerful guide that uh, all of us has used in our life journeys, but also in our journey in life in general, not just uh, our journey in the movement. It's something that has guided us in our day-to-day -day life, even in our communities, has helped us to resolve issues that would have escalated, but also to create peace and come together as uh, one community of uh, one great human uh, family. I also wish to, in a very special way, extend uh, my sincere gratitude and thanks to Stefan Gigash and the Australian Kadan Institute for making this gathering possible. Uh, Stefan, I would like to say, I know I've been working with you for some time now, that uh, your unwavering commitment uh, to nurturing the wise spirit is a beacon for our movement. And it is through initiatives like these that uh, we continue to thrive and grow together. And as uh, Father Michael uh, was sharing how they started the journeys with the YCS in, in, in South Africa, these are some of those kind of initiatives that brought the movement to life and that keeps the movement alive and keeps the movement growing and keeps the movement going. But not just the movement, the spirit and, and, and the values that the movement shares. And also, as we we go forth in this webinar, I would just like to uh, encourage us to carry with us this profound message that uh, Father Mike has imparted on us. And may we be ever mindful that through our actions, rooted uh, in thoughtful reflections and prayer, we encounter God and become instruments of transformation in our world. Because... As we journey in life, many people look out to us, especially those of us who have had the chance to be part of this great movement that is all over the world. Many get inspired when they see our life journey and when they listen to our story. So let this moment continue to inspire us to be renewed in our commitment to the mission of the YCS, especially for us, the younger ones I see here on the call, who are joining us still in active leadership, to use these um, life lessons, but also to share with the younger ones in your, your sections, in your dioceses, and also to the seniors who are here, I implore you to com continue to accompany the YCS in your, your, it could be in your parishes, could be in your diocese, wherever you are, there are many young YCSs that need accompaniment. Accompaniment has been part and parcel of our movement since uh, its beginning, uh, since uh, its life journey started. And it's a very important aspect. I remember back in uh, our national team when I was still in the national level uh, in Uganda, our chaplain always told us he's there, but he's not to do anything for us. If he needs something, we go to ask him for advice. And when he gives us advice, he would tell us first, what do you think you could handle if we had any problem, anything which was uh, difficult for us? Then we would tell him what we think and he would tell us, go. First, try that out. If it doesn't work out, come back. But I could tell you each time we go back, we would go to give feedback of the success that we have achieved because 
as our accompaniment of that time, it was always inspiring and encouraging us to take actions based on the Sea Judge Act uh, spirituality, what we think would be better in that situation. And that, in a way, kind of inspired a lot of us. That's why until today, we are still actively involved in the leadership of the YCS. So I just want to emphasize that accompaniment is very, very important. And that's why the presence of the chaplains and the seniors in the movement is very, very crucial. And uh, we will continue to count on your presence and on your years of experience to help us as we uh, journey in our active leadership of the YCS uh, movement uh, today. And I just want to conclude by thanking all of you. And um, may we continue together in this journey with renewed faith, courage, and purpose. And uh, lastly, I just want to say that uh, uh, currently we have got a team of volunteers of the senior wise sisters or former wise sisters from around the world who have come together to organize the next uh, global gathering of the senior wise sisters or former wise sisters in Rome next year in October. And um, like I said, these are volunteers currently is being uh, uh, co-shared by uh, Teresa Murad. Uh, formerly from Singapore, now currently based in Washington, D.C., in the USA, and Jermaine from uh, Ivory Coast uh, with, as the co-chair, I mean, from Cameroon. And then some of us are part of this committee, and uh, it's good that we have many from Australia here because the idea of the the committee is to co-op uh, volunteers from all over all the continents around. So if we can have uh, some volunteers also from Australia, would be great uh, so that we can work together. We are currently in the process of consultation about the theme of the meeting, what would be the objectives and all that, the things to be discussed. But the date so far has already been scheduled for second week to third week of October of 2025. And we are working on the logistical issues to find the venue and all that. Yeah, so I would uh, invite you to join. I posted in the chat just to request that uh, I see many new faces today. If I could just have... Uh, you introduce yourself in the chat a little bit because we also part of this uh, committee, myself and Richard, my predecessor, uh, we are helping to uh, to create a database of uh, the seniors uh, from all around the world so that uh, this would go into our archives. And uh, it's good that the initiatives like his in South Africa, writing book about some of those key figures. This is also one way we can gather so that we can have in one place a record of all uh, those who have gone through the movements, who have contributed in many ways. And those who are still around with us, with their experiences, when we need some input, you can easily always go to the database and say, oh, uh, so-and-so is there at the light, is there, is exp expertise in this field. We can always be able to reach out uh, whenever we need them. So thank you, and sorry, I take a little bit more time. Uh, it's great to hear from you again, Innocent. Uh, for those who weren't here for our webinar last month, we had the privilege of having Innocent as our speaker, and that was very inspiring and worthwhile as well. We also have on the call Ashish Shalagain, who's the coordinator of YCW in Australia. And Ashish, I think, can give us a bit of an update about what some of the YCS groups have been up to in recent times. So, Ashish, if you could uh, unmute and over to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, ACI, for organizing this webinar. It was really fruitful. I just want to take a quick time of you to update about what's happening in Australia in terms of AYC. Yes, and no AYCW. So at this point of time, we are we basically are in the process of rebuilding in terms of YCS. We have a strong YCS movement in Parramatta, which is supported by the majors and a YCW and Parramatta diocese. We have three students schools groups that have been running different actions ranging from addressing the issue of discrimination to sexual violence to women's right to environmental and climate change issues. We now have new school where we will have decided from the national campaign that we would be focusing on educating young students and young workers about the war crime issues. Because in turn, what you have seen is especially young people when they go, when they graduate from a school, although they come out of the school and they go to the work of world of work, they don't know much about the war work rights, and that's when they get exploited. And that's when they 
feel like their dignity is at at peril. So that was one of the actions that we kind of of realized in terms of developing a program called Student Work Life, and that's already been launched in different part of the Australia. We have some similar kind of program happening in um, Melbourne, and similar kind of action that's happening in Perth. It would be really good. I mean, it's really good to announce in terms of how YCW and YCS is collaborating together in Australia. We have our national secretary who comes from the YCS background, and he's a young fellow and he's still in YCS. His name is Sudeep. One of the really dynamic of YCS here in Australia is how young students of different faith background and cultural background are actually coming together in the card and methodology to deepen their understanding and even their own faith and find a solution to their problem. That has been really instrumental. We have, like I said, our secretary does identify as a Christian or a Catholic, but he is a Hindu. But in terms of his faith, He's very much motivated with the inclusions also I think we discussed about earlier and there are other actions happening um, in days to come. So we are celebrating 100 years of IYCW in, in Australia in next year uh, in Melbourne. Uh, that's going to be exciting and we have been planning to organize it together with YCS. And as a last update, I think I just need to mention it that the YCS is now being led in terms of by the YCS from different uh, groups in different states, and they're planning to come together and organize the Australian YCS together in uh, in next year. So that's an update that I have about Australian YCS and AYCS. Thank you. Great, thanks for that update, Ashish. Now I know we've been holding off on getting questions to Mike for a little while now, so it's uh, now it's the opportunity. We have probably about ten minutes or so that we can uh, keep him online before he has to go back to work. So um, please feel free if you if you have can use the hand raise function in Zoom that would be helpful. Otherwise, if you're not across that, perhaps just speak up and we'd be very happy to take your questions. And I'll have a little look in the chat. I know a few people have been putting questions in the chat as well. Um, so are there any? Is anybody like to kick us off with a question? Maybe it's my opportunity to go first. I, I've had a bit of background with YCS. I'm a school teacher by trade, Mike, and I've had probably about, I don't know, 35 years in Catholic schools here. And I've also been a mentor for the YCS um, workers here in, Param in Parramatta Diocese. And one of the things that um, you touched on already, and I probably worth saying a little bit more about, is that the 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 dichotomy between action and reflection and we see groups tend to be very easily classified as either a spiritual group or a faith group or a formation or a prayer group or something like that as opposed to a justice or an action group and I think that's been one of the challenges that we've faced here in in Australia is how do we how do we actually genuinely bring a faith and action perspective together so that it um you know that it, it meaningfully unites those things so that they're not sort of put as opposing forces so i don't, i don't know if you'd like to say anything more about how you've been able to do that in your experience i think that uh, thanks for that question pat um i suppose that's been one of my biggest concerns and i've already said a lot about it um but i think the the crucial issue is how to raise the God question or the faith question, which many young people, especially maybe it's not an issue for them, uh, but they're just wanting to get on with it. And I think that's what has, because there hasn't been a push for it um, in many places, therefore we buy, we sort of pass over it quite quickly. Um, but that's that's where it needs a provo some provocative questioning about you know how people cons or think about God or faith or church or these sorts of things um and and maybe when that question is posed then it then it could then it, that's what 
provides the the opening in a way to start looking at how God relates to me, to my what I'm doing, to my action or my lack of action. And um, that, that depends then on good accompaniment, especially for young people and for, even for no matter what age people, um, to be reflecting on our on how our lives are connected to the life of faith, if you like. Um, even if the word God is, is a, many people react to it in our current world. Um, and uh, we've got to find a new language even for talking about that. And I think um, that's where there's a real need for us, for those of us who are accompanying people, whether they be young people or even people of whatever age, in, um, in, in to, to be seeing the question of how does my life relate to, to God or the future or the where I see we going and what my what, what things are where, where, where it's all headed for. So I think that we need to be just raising that question. Um, and that could happen often in a context of a particular formation event or a talk or something like that. But especially, but especially in small groups, and that's where our small group um, focus is is quite fundamental and the most effective, as we've always known. Um, but uh, you know, just asking people a question about it and getting them to see it, see how they respond. So. Well, often that's what provokes a question that people haven't had necessarily of their own. So that would be my response. I don't know if it answers the Thanks, question. Mike. Well, I guess, no, it, it does. It's a great help. And I think one of the things we've seen here is by asking young people to speak about what has great meaning for them leads you into that sort of conversation around spirituality rather than what does faith mean or what does religion mean but actually take it from their context of what has the most meaning for you and what gives you life and brings you you know joy and happiness and so on those type of things can often lead to that conversation so i see go has the, the um hand up so i'll throw over to you for question or comment Is it me? Uh, hi. 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 Your colleague on me on? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we, we, we're kind of, you're dropping in and out a bit, but just try anyway. Okay, yeah, because I'm outdoors or using a mobile. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we, can we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the book. I, I really felt very heartened when I heard my talk about the reflections, um, the self-criticism and the conversion. Uh, it resonated with me very well because when I share the CJJAC methods in, in Singapore, um, that's one thing I say, that's one of the significant difference between uh, of the, this review of life method we call it CJJAC. So I'm so pleased to know that you have covered that in the book. I'm really looking forward to read the book. And secondly, the, the other point which resonated very well with me was the action because I do see lots of effort and time energy put into a lot of events. Uh, some of them are very uh, useful actions uh, because you need to reach out to youth and through some of these events. But at the same time, there's often this confusion with these events to actions. So I, I really like this, this two point. Um, I'm very glad that uh, this is uh, mentioned. It will be mentioned in the book. I just want to say that, um, uh, uh, add on if you could hear me. A uh, few days ago, Theresa Morat celebrated her 60th birthday from Singapore, Singapore. Um, and, uh, in, um, a, a few, a week's time, a few days' time, Avito and, uh, Alex Padibis from India, they were in the Asian team, twice years team in the 70s. They are coming down to visit us after many, many years. So we are looking forward to the YCS members, former YCS, to meet them and uh, catch up with them. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity to share. I hope you hear me. Uh, apologies for the bad uh, reception. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that. There's, there was a question in the chat, which I'm just trying to get back to. Um, and it was a question 
uh, here we go. Um, could you tell us how you have changed along with the changes in South Africa and how this affects the approach to social justice today? And how do you see the challenge to the church today? Yes, it's from Kevin. Hi, Kevin, and you must send me your email address. <laughs> um, I think, obviously, I could talk for hours about this, but um, I've changed. I, I mentioned my first major conversion in that time, just um, in 1975, when I had encountered all the, the black students. But through the process of using this methodology, and I've been in groups regularly doing it, um, it's it's opened my mind to first seeing what's going on around, analyzing much more deeply, and especially by putting faith in the in the group and realizing I can't do this sort of thing alone. Often we do these things alone, you know, academics especially do a lot of that sort of thing on their own, many of them. But uh, it, it made me realize the importance of, of being part of groups where we can bounce things off others. And it, it always enriches, it's enriched me all along the way. So my whole journey, you know, starting with people like Kevin, who's here and others, we, we, um, we, we were grappling together with things. And that's why, you know, I gave that story about Kali and Albert because we were grappling with all of these things and it and it didn't stop after that. And um that enabled me to also broaden my perspective. I realized when I was a student that I was quite sort of hard line, if you like, um, in terms of had a very clear analysis and we were very influenced obviously by Marxist analysis at that point. And we had a at one point there was this we said we had to make a clear clear commitment against capitalism and for socialism. And we were very strong on those sorts of things. And even though I would still see myself having a still believe that, you know, Jesus' understanding of sharing and all that sort of thing, it has to be incorporate a more socialistic perspective of life and definitely against the individualism of a capitalist perspective. But I think I've I've managed to uh, to deepen my understanding of that so that I wasn't so sort of um, doctrinaire, if you like, as I've been challenged by things as I've gone along, and um, and that's that. That, uh, that holds me in good stead today, but often it puts me in trouble because I'm surrounded, we're still surrounded, especially here and I'm sure all over the world, we see people who are very doctrinaire about their particular thing. And with the polarization that's going on in the world today, people are so stuck in their particular ideological frameworks that it's so difficult to break through that and to break through the polarization and to... Uh, that's my biggest preoccupation personally today, how to break through this ideological polarization that takes place. And I think the church has a big role to play in that because we have all these sorts within the church. And that's, I think, one of the major challenges we find, not only in relation to the big global issues like the Ukraine-Russia war, like the the Israel, Gaza, Israeli um, genocide in Gaza and things like that. Um, these are the big global issues, but the polarization is horrific. And and when I, I've just been going into a bit of the idea, understanding of Christian Zionism, which long preceded Jewish Zionism, um, and how they they've affected and influenced so many people throughout the world, not only in the US, but everywhere. So that has become an ideology, but based in a particular theology. And I think the big challenge for the church is to engage ecumenically and to counter the what I see as the evil of this Christian Zionist approach to life and faith and God and and very much linked to um, the identity politics that we see 
prevailing all over the world and that's leading us, many of us, to even lose hope uh, when we see that how these two big wars of uh, Russia, Ukraine and uh, Israel and Palestine, it's, uh, it has this strong potential to provoke a, a world war, which I don't think is that far off. Um, so in the face of that, we have a, a huge role to play in trying to uh, challenge or, or address these uh, false understandings of the faith that I okay, maybe it's a bit of an arrogant thing to say, but an under, a reading of scripture, which clearly is just suiting people's particular ideological position. And we, that needs means we have to be humble ourselves. And I've had to be, and I, I'm forced myself to say, am I being humble enough? You know, am I able to even listen to the other side? Uh, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestine thing, I find it very difficult to to even listen to the other side because it just seems so off the wall and so violent. And but, but I've got to try and get into that. And I think we all have to try and get into the into the minds and hearts of those people who are committing these genocides and things like that to to be able to see how we can understand where they're coming from and what what needs to happen to address that. I don't know if we have time to do all of that in our world today, but that's what I think the church is called to do. Thanks, Mark. Now, Kevin, you had another question in the chat. I think, do you want to throw that in and we might get a quick response from Mike? Because we do need to wrap up fairly soon. Well, I, I think it kind of continues from what you're saying about the challenge, because my concern is we need to belong and we need the church community but my fear is the church community is being taken over by those ultra conservative, what you calling Christian Zionists, and um, and we need to be able to balance the spiritual and the social justice, and not allow the church to push that aside, um, because the church uh, is where I feel I belong, and I kind of hold on with my fingernails. Um, because it's got the spiritual dimension that I need, but it quite often uh, negates the social action and the equality issues about male and female and so on and so on. Mike, over to you. Well, I think the church has always been, as we have said, this big whore <laughs> or prostitute. And I think that uh, there's always been different elements within the church um, that, uh, I mean, I use that just, to, you know, using Hosea's uh, characterization of Israel. But um, clearly we're never going to be able to transform the whole church, even though we are blessed to have someone like Pope Francis at the moment who has a, an approach, which I think accords much more closely to the concerns you are raising, Kevin, and that I think we are all raising, they've been raising in our movements. So we're blessed to have that. We don't know who's going to succeed him, of course, so things could always easily go the other way. But I think the church will always be this diverse body, this diverse community. There will always be these different perspectives and elements within them. And we have to be, of course, the whole synodal, synodal process is trying to get them to start talking more to each other. And I think we have to engage ourselves with that process to be talking even to our enemies and to be seeing how we can begin to live together with them. But I think that for our own personal nourishment, we, we cannot rely on the broader church to always provide that. We have to find like-minded people, people who have the same, same sort of concerns as us, um, to and we've got to be developing these sorts of communities. The you know, even our movements, you know, YCS, YCW are such communities, but those are big movements. But even if we don't have those sorts of movements, we can um we need to be uh trying to find other people around us where who we can meet with regularly, even if it's small groups. Um uh 
many of our former YCS members have formed themselves into regular here in South Africa, have formed themselves into regular mass groups. They meet uh, once a month or something like that, and and that that continues to be their dominant experience of church. And I think that if we we need to find such people, it doesn't have to be people from the past, but it can be people from the present that we are. Um, encountering in a new way and there are lots of new sort of communities uh, uh, rising as well we have to find those and we have to find our personal needs met especially at that level and hopefully that will enable us to to also integrate the theology that i was talking about that often people who are concerned about social justice issues often end up not talking about what others regard as church or spiritual things. So there's a big challenge for us to to raise that God question or that church question or that the spirituality question in our groups fairly regularly so that we 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 can even portray ourselves more broadly as not just social activists but people who are really concerned about the church and and God and and the future of faith in the world. So that that would be my answer to you, Kevin. That we need to just start small and find those around us, and not look to the whole broader church necessarily to satisfy us. There are enough elements in that broader church, from our Catholic social teachings, from the wonderful theology. That's there's so many amazing theologians that can nourish us at all those levels we must never lose sight of them and uh, even if there are others who can become a dominant force and uh, by the way the conservatives aren't all necessarily christian zionists there's a there are many different strands within them christian zionists are a very particular form and they are they are mostly in these more sort of uh, evangelical churches who would be promoting that but we do have our significant number of people, even from the Catholic Church, who are in there as well. So, but I think we need to be engaging with them. I've tried to engage with quite a lot of people, for example, on this this uh, Palestine issue. Some they just didn't want to talk. Um, so that's that's pained me a lot, and I'm still trying to find ways to do that, even people in my own family. Um, but uh, some of those things we're never going to, we're not going to be able to solve all those things, as Jesus himself said, you know. Uh, often when we think of uh, God or, or Jesus, it divides families and all sorts of others, and sometimes the, the divisions are almost irreconcilable. So we've got to, in some ways, be able to grapple and come to terms with that, painful as it is. But hopefully... If we change our own approach to be more humble, more dialogical, more willing to listen, hopefully we can begin to make a, a slight change and dent in that. Thanks, Mike, and thank you again, Kevin, for that question. Um, we've reached the end of our time, I think, and uh, we were to throw to David, who was going to say uh, a word of thanks to Mike. David, are you able to be heard? Uh, it looks as though you're not. No, so apologies that we have seemed to have lost David through technical things, and I'm sure he had some very well... I might, uh, I might jump in and say a couple of words myself. So I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to Hillary to Innocent and to Ashish for their contributions tonight. But most of all, of course, big thank you to Mike for that wonderful presentation and some very thoughtful answers to the questions. Um, certainly, we live in very difficult times and uh, your contribution through decades of work with the movement, your reflections that you put in writings and your continuing ongoing challenges, not only to us, but also as we heard today, to some very diverse groups of people, I think is uh, is giving us a great deal of hope and, and confidence that, that despite the size of the challenges, I think we're in, in a good space to continue our work and to continue to make a difference in the world, which is ultimately what we seek to do. So again, a very heartfelt thanks for your contribution and thank you everybody for joining us for our, our webinar tonight. 
And uh, we wish you all a very good night or good day, whichever part of the world you're in, and look forward to catching up again next time we uh, gather for one of these webinars. So good night and thank you. Thank you and God bless you all.